All right, good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing? All right. It's time to wake this room up. All right, all right, settle down. Okay, so everybody here, I'm sure, is aware of the law that created the caregiver program. It was passed back in 2010. The caregiver program uh, gives supports and services to caregivers of post 9-11 veterans. Those things include education, training, some respite services so they can take a break from their caregiving duties. They get a modest stipend uh, because they are foregoing their ability to work and make a living. And it also provides health care coverage through, through CHAMP VA if they don't already have one. But here's the problem with the bill. Here's the problem with the law. It's not equitable, it restricts choice, and it costs more. So today, many caregivers of severely disabled veterans are aging, and their ability to continue in their role is declining. Many of you in this room are intimately familiar with that. And although most caregivers continue to undertake this role selflessly, willingly, they don't have access to VA's comprehensive caregiver support program that was established by that law back in 2010. Now, there is a cost to providing access to VA's caregiver program. That's the cost right there. Well, it's actually half that now, believe it or not. It's about $18,000. State veterans' homes, about $51,000 a year. Community nursing home, $100,000 a year. VA nursing home, because it usually resides in a hospital, in a VA hospital, it's quite a bit more. Now let me say this again, right? You see these numbers up here. It costs less to keep a veteran at home with their caregiver and giving that caregiver their support and services than it is for that veteran to be in a nursing home. Imagine that. It costs less. Better for the veteran. But this is what we hear from Congress today. Oh, it costs too much money. I'll tell you something else. Beyond these numbers, caregivers actually are shown by numerous studies to lessen the overall cost because they take care of their patient, because they take care of their veterans, the veteran's medical complication goes down. The number of times they get admitted in a hospital goes down if they have a family caregiver. So not only does the program cost less if you get them in there, they drive down the overall cost even further. So the bottom line is there is no equal access to VA's caregiver program, and that's what this campaign is for. This is a legislative priority for the DAV. It is also a priority for all these other organizations, VFW, PVA, American Legion, IAVA. Because of this legislative priority, we created the, uh, way, a website for this campaign, and we've had some legislation introduced. This is the website, and that's the web address up there at the top. At the bottom here are some resources for caregivers. If they go to the site and they need some more information about anything from s local services to federal services and supports, those are a couple of links that they can click on. But for our purposes here in midwinter, you can find the current legislation to expand the eligibility for uh, VA's caregiver program here, as well as an issue brief. Now, this issue brief obviously accessible to anybody, but in this way, anybody can learn more about this issue. This little link up here in the corner, you wouldn't know that it's a link because it's a picture, but it is a link. I think you will find this interesting. If you click on this link, you're going to get this. It's a caregiver of veterans a picture by the numbers. Now the information on this is based on a report by the RAND Corporation, the same RAND Corporation that Peter mentioned that did the independent assessment on VA. The RAND Corporation surveyed caregivers of veterans and this is what they found. There's a major difference between caregivers of pre-9-11 veterans and caregivers of post-9-11 veterans. This is the medical conditions. But more interestingly, they found that caregivers of pre-9-11 veterans actually support 
more when it comes to basic self-care tasks, you know, going to the bathroom, getting out of bed. They do more of that than pre-9-11 uh, caregivers of pre-9-11 veterans, of post-9-11 veterans, I'm sorry. Caregivers of pre-9-11 veterans also provide more complex tasks, grocery shopping, cooking, cleaning, those things, those supports that veterans need to remain independent in their community, to stay out of a nursing home. They do more of this. So now, what has happened since we put the website up, uh, legislation has been introduced. Some of you may remember back in November, we actually sent out an alert on these bills and we got a fantastic response from our DAV, from our uh, DAV CAN members. We got thousands of emails sent up to the Hill and guess what happened? A month later, the House Veterans Affairs Committee had a hearing. We testified at that hearing. We told them about the importance of this program. We told them about how the program can be improved and that it should be expanded. Guess what happened? In the Senate, legislation was introduced and in December, the Senate VA committee actually passed a bill to expand the program. S-425. Now that bill, it's called the Veterans Homeless Programs, Caregiver Services and Other Improvements Act of 2015. It actually contains a provision from S-1085 from Senator P Patty Murray out of Washington. That bill would expand the caregiver program to all veterans over four years. It's a phase in. And we understand this because phasing in a program of this magnitude has to be done quite carefully so don't, we don't create expectations and then fail to meet them. So we're quite comfortable with that. Um, but unfortunately, the House has not acted on any bill as of yet, even though they have three different bills to choose from. So what do we do next? This is what I need you to do while you're here in Washington this midwinter. You have to keep in mind that the full Senate, because the VA, Senate VA committee already passed the bill, the full Senate actually has to approve it. So that bill has to be approved by the full Senate. Now in the House, we want the VA committee to do what their Senate, commi Senate VA committee did. They, we want the House VA committee to pass a bill. So the Senate, full Senate needs to pass a bill. And the House, the House VA committee needs to pass a bill. What is this for? So that when they pass a bill, both sides of Congress, the House and the Senate, can come together and hammer out a deal. Now, we have, we have to get the House VA committee to approve a bill. We need this if we, stand, if we are to stand a chance to actually finally expanding the caregiver program to caregivers of veterans of all eras. So in order to do this, here's what I need you to do. Take a look at your talking points. Those should have been handed out to you already. When you go meet your senators, all senators, ask them to pass 425. It's waiting at the desk at the floor of the Senate. If you are meeting with a member in the House and your member is a member of the VA committee, the House VA committee, how many here? Richard has one. A couple other hands out there. You folks are at the tip of the spear for this campaign this midwinter. What you do and how you are able to, to urge and, and influence your member to act will take this ball that much closer down to a touchdown. So that's it for the caregiver campaign. Everybody understand that? Senate has to pass a bill. House VA has to pass a bill. I'm not done yet. Hold on, hold your applause, hold your applause. So there's two more little tidbits. This is pending legislation. I can't let you go until I let you know what they've actually done um, or what they're waiting for to do for us this second session of Congress. H.R. 3549, VA Billing Accountability Act, you like this. This bill would actually allow VA to waive your co-payment if they delay notifying you of that bill. I like that. So if v VA, if you owe VA a co-payment 
and they delay sending you that notice, that bill in the mail, something like 60 days, I think, VA can waive that copayment. Kind of fair, I think. Jason Simkowski Promise Act, that actually deals with the opioid uh, epidemic. Everybody here heard of this issue across the country? This is right up our alley. We have a resolution that falls in line with this bill. Our resolution talks about reducing dependence on opioid, but you have to substitute that with something. You can't just drop veterans off. You gotta provide them alternative therapies, and that's what this bill would do. The, let's move down to the last one because this one is, uh, this one is actually very important. S2170, the Vets Act of 2015. This deals with telemedicine. Now part of our reform, our, our four R's, we actually talk about expanding telehealth, right? This crosses state lines. Unfortunately, the law doesn't allow doctors to practice across state lines even if you're doing telehealth. So this bill will help. How many veterans here actually go to a facility that's in a separate state? 280,000 veterans, including those in the audience here who raise their hands, have this problem. They cannot get telehealth from their VA facility because it's across the state. That's what this bill would help do. It would allow those qualified clinicians to provide telehealth across state lines. Now, last one. These are enacted bills. Congress actually passed bills that will help our members. And here are some of the, some of the uh, provisions. So Defense Authorization Act of 2016 has a provision in there that tells DOD that it must share exposure information with regards to burn pits and open hazards, something we've been looking for for the last several years. The other, bill, the other law, Department of Veterans Affairs Expiring Authorities Act of 2015 extends three very important um, authorities. It would extend nursing home care for service-connected veterans. You know, if you're a priority group one veteran, VA actually has to provide you nursing home care. They cannot wiggle their way out of it. That authority is extended through December of 2016. The caregiver program is actually reauthorized through fiscal year 2016. And the last one, continuing studies of the effects of Agent Orange. This is where VA contracts with IOM. This actually got extended through December 2016. And that's all I have for you folks. A lot shorter than, uh... okay. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave that alone, thank you. Next is uh, uh, Leroy Acosta. He's gonna talk about some uh, benefits legislation as well as our campaign in the benefits arena. Thank you.